My name is Rohit Talreja. I'm a product manager on the Google Cloud Healthcare and Life Sciences team. I focus specifically on data governance, so I hope it makes sense why I'm giving the security and compliance session here today. Uh, thanks for joining. I, I know it's a little bit late in the afternoon. Thanks for staying awake. I hope to keep you that way. Um, so here, you know, today I'm here to kind of talk about what we call the shared responsibility model. And what that means is, you know, when we have uh, customers who are using a cloud service, it's a little bit different than older models of infrastructure such as on-premise, right? So when we think about the shared security model, there exists some responsibilities that fall to the cloud provider and some responsibilities that fall to the user or the customer. And, and this is kind of the frame of reference for the talk today. We'll be going over, you know, how Google thinks about healthcare compliance with a focus is probably on HIPAA, uh, and then talking about what you, know, you as our users can do with that context and what else you may have to think about as you build, design, and secure your workloads on Google Cloud for healthcare data. All right. So just setting a little bit of context, right? Uh, healthcare data is under duress, as I call it, right? Healthcare organizations are experiencing, on average, more than twice the number of attacks compared to organizations in other vertical categories, right? And when we talk about attacks, what are we talking about? All right, uh, but before we get to that, let's talk about why this matters, right? The cost of a data breach is going up year over year over year. So it, a study that was conducted between February of 2017 and April of 2018 calculated that the average cost of a data breach was just under $4 million. So what does this cover, right? This covers the loss of customers due to reputation loss. This covers you know, the data that was affected, potentially fines uh, coming over that, the cost of forensics, the cost of communication to regulators, to customers, to affected parties, and of course, long-term damages, right? And long-term damages to reputation being the primary motivator of this cost. So when we talk about causes of data breach, it's also good to know who is experiencing them, right? So this startling number, over 90% of healthcare organizations have experienced a breach in under, in, within the last three years. And 50% of healthcare organizations have suffered five or more breaches in that same time frame, right? So when I say healthcare data is under duress, I hope this now comes across, right? And, and again, it's, it's important to point out that when we say a breach, it's not necessarily hacking, it's not necessarily malicious. It could be a doctor sending a, a fax, yes, a fax, to the wrong office. It could be a patient, you know, sending data from their doctor to a third party. It could be a doctor, you know, not disposing of records appropriately when that patient leaves the system. So it's important to say that a breach is, is a loaded term, right? It's both malicious and anything that's defined in the, the regulation. All right. So let's talk more about costs, right? Specifically, distributed denial of service attacks, which are becoming more and more popular over time. We all remember you know, the distributed denial of service attacks that took place in the last couple of years. They crippled a number of institutions. Uh, they cost about $2 million a piece. And every 40 seconds, a healthcare organization is hit with a ransom, ransomware attack. And the same assessment said that one in six healthcare organizations are affected. Okay. Now that I've scared you a little bit, let's scare you a little bit more. So when we think about the number of attacks going up, right, one would, one would assume that the number of protections is also rising to meet that increase in attacks. Actually, it's unfortunately the opposite. Cybersecurity budgets in healthcare organizations have dropped to just about 3% of total spend. This is not to say that healthcare organizations' budgets are decreasing overall. Actually, the amount that healthcare organizations are spending is increasing year over year. However, the amount spent on cybersecurity is constant meaning that, in proportion, less money is being spent on increasingly important areas. All right, so why is healthcare a prime target, right? I, I think most people know this, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit into specifics. Healthcare data is rich, and when I say the data is rich, it means that I can get data about multiple aspects of an individual, just by breaching one system, right? So if we think about your, your email account, maybe that has some personal identifying information. Your bank account maybe has some personal identifying information. But really, when you think about those security questionnaires you fill in, right? What was your mother's maiden name? What street did you grow up in? Where were your parents born? Where were you born? There's really only one place where all of that information is, healthcare records. 
And that means that the total, let's say, cost-benefit analysis to a hacker looking for where do I spend my hacking monies and time, healthcare data is less protected and more useful. Therefore, let's look at that, right? The other reason why healthcare data is a prime target is because their data is stored primarily in legacy systems. So we know cybersecurity budget's going down. We talked about that. Systems are older, easier to breach, theoretically. Uh, and lastly, there is a specific category of hackers who hack for fun, hack to cause the most damage possible, right? And when we look at healthcare organizations taken down by things like WannaCry, taken down by things like DDoS attacks, downtime impacts patient safety. And therefore, people who get pleasure out of taking down these organizations are looking to healthcare because, unfortunately, it causes a lot of damage. So, you know, where can we go from here, right? And, and as I said, this, this talk will be focused on what, both what Google is doing in the healthcare compliance and security space and what you as users of Google Cloud can do to help prevent all of these types of attacks. All right. So, Level setting, I know, the, you know this, this audience probably knows more than the average audience about what HIPAA is and what it entails, but HIPAA, US regulation for the protection of healthcare data known as protected health information. So if you hear me use the acronym PHI throughout this talk, I'm referring to healthcare information as defined under HIPAA, but we can probably generalize that to mean any sensitive healthcare information globally. Uh, the same sort of protections would apply. All right, so HIPAA, is broken into three requirements, three sections of requirements. We have administrative safeguards, which is basically how you run your business, how you hire people, how you give them access to systems, what they do with those systems, whether you plan for disaster events. And then we have physical safeguards, right? It's like, how, when do you let people into your buildings? Where do you store your IT systems? Who gets access to your IT systems? Before you give a vendor access to your server closet, what you know sort of processes are in place to make sure that they're properly vetted and they're only doing what they should be doing. And lastly, the biggest bucket, which is where I'll spend most of the time today, is technical safeguards, right? So HIPAA, being a slightly older law, uh, was not necessarily created for the cloud environment. However, it has been uh, amended a couple of times to account for higher tech activities, and it has been interpreted by the government and by you know, industry groups to make sure that the technical safeguards under HIPAA have somewhat caught up with growing technology trends. So in terms of what we'll be talking about today, we'll talk about identity and access control, encryption and transmission protection, audit logging, activity logging, uh, logging and audit controls. So I'll touch upon these both, you know, first from the Google side and then from the customer side. All right, so you know, it's important to talk about HIPAA in the HIPAA BAA when talking about HIPAA. The Business Associate Agreement, or BAA, is the contract that formalizes the requirements between uh, the service provider, the business associate, and the covered entity, generally the insurance plan, the provider system, or the healthcare information clearinghouse. Right? And this BAA basically formalizes the relationship and says both parties agree that HIPAA data is being exchanged uh, in this contract. And here are the security requirements that are in place that govern the use, protection, transmission of that healthcare data. It's important to note that you know, Google Cloud is one of the few providers that offers a rigorous enterprise grade BAA that covers a large number of GCP services. And even more than that, we do it at no additional cost to the customer because we believe that you know, security in healthcare is not optional, right? We shouldn't give you fewer protections just because you're in healthcare and have a tight budget. So all of our protections in the BAA are there by default. There's no upcharge. And specifically, it includes you know, any region, any instance size that's covered uh, for the service in the BAA and has all the protections around breach notification uh, and encryption by default. All right, so going into detail, right? Administrative safeguards, what are they? This is Google's security program. We design our security system with, a, with an approach we call defense in depth. So whereas the traditional security model is, you know, have a hard perimeter, right? Make it very hard for people to get onto your network uh, using things like tough firewalls, VPNs, bastion hosts, you know, dedicated machines that can access that network. But, you know, think of it like an eggshell, right? If you have a hard perimeter, but then once you're inside, GUI center. 
So anybody who gets onto that network can then have free access to anything that is on the network, your EHR systems, your billing systems, you know, you name it. Anything that's on the network, they have, if they can compromise your network. Instead, Google enforces defense in depth by putting different sort of protections that are relevant to different attacks at different levels of the infrastructure. So for example, when we talk about hardware, right, Google designs uh, and plans our own server hardware, storage hardware, compute hardware. And by doing so, not only do we control the exact performance of the hardware to meet the specifications that we need, we can also cut out unnecessary components and control our supply chain down to off-the-shelf components, reducing vendor in the middle risk. Taking it all the way to the top layer, uh, you know, we have a robust identity layer in place that only allows approved individuals to access services and only services that have been approved to communicate with each other to perform activities with each other. So I won't talk through all of this slide in detail, but this is you know, just trying to say there's a defense in depth approach that is fundamental to everything we do in security down from our, our culture to our technical controls and our operations. I think it's... Uh, this slide hopefully should give you an idea that we understand security certifications, table stakes, right? As part of the administrative actions of running a secure compliance program, Google has gone out and gotten certifications that are relevant to us as a cloud provider, such as ISO, uh, which is fundamental cloud security and privacy certifications, as well as specific uh, certifications that are specific to our customers, which helps them grow on Google Cloud. So this is things like HITRUST, this is things like FedRAMP, uh, basically certifications where any vendor in the chain needs to be certified so that the one that's providing the final service to the end customer can get certified as well. All right. Continuing on to administrative activities, Google regularly conducts uh, disaster recovery drills by simulating real world scenarios, right? So these could be a fake earthquake that potentially knocks out power to a data center, which of course we simulate, hopefully, <laughs> you know, dropping the power to the internet, things like that. There was a day in the office where I showed up to work, the video conferencing cut mid-meeting, uh, somebody sent a text message that said, oh, by the way, the internet is down for the next three hours. Enjoy. Tell us what you did so we can write it down for the actual plan going forward. And I say this as a cavalier story, but really these teams are, you know, these tests are designed to give teams the ability to respond to real world scenarios. And how they respond to the test tests their plan of action and also helps them improve their plan of action for when real incidents occur. All right. So talking about, you know, again, administrative actions, right? What is Google doing to run a proper HIPAA program, proper healthcare compliance program? This is the list of services covered by the BAA as of some time last week. Uh, I would probably be willing to say that it's already out of date in that we continue to add more services to the BAA over time. They're being added very rapidly. There's probably a couple more that have been added in the last week. All right. So when we talk about physical safeguards, facilities management, right? So physical, physical safeguards I won't spend too much time talking about because it really just uh, depends on how do we run our data centers, how do we run our offices. When we talk about our data centers, our data centers are some of the most protected buildings uh, in, in the world, right? They're protected by custom designed electronic access cards, alarms, perimeter defenses, laser beam detections. Imagine, you know, a heist movie. Anything you see in that heist movie, we probably have it, and there's probably some other stuff in there that they won't show in the movies. All right, safe to say, facility access is tightly controlled. Only approved uh, you know, employees and their guests and vendors, potentially, people, you know, people who should be there are there. They're vetted before they get there, background checks are done, and so on. All right, technical safeguards. Defense in depth. I talked about this. This just kind of shows you know, our fundamental approach to technical safeguards, and then going into some detail. We have encryption by default at rest. And, and when I say by default, what do I mean? Uh, what I mean is customers don't have to check a box that says turn on default encryption. They don't have to you know, say what size keys they want, what level of encryption, what data stores are in scope for encryption or not. No. Data on REST on Google Cloud Platform is encrypted. This is a sample of one layer of encryption. So different services, different storage uh, applications have maybe multiple levels of encryption. This just kind of shows an individual file coming into Google Cloud. And what happens here is that file is broken into multiple pieces. Each of these pieces is encrypted with its own key. 
then we wrap that key with a key encryption key so that we don't store keys in plain text. The keys are also encrypted. And then each of these files and their encryption key is put into a different physical system in many cases, right? So this, this is basically saying data is not only encrypted, it's, in, it's split up, encrypted, and then distributed across the infrastructure so that a failure in any one machine or multiple machines does not compromise the integrity of the file. It also means that you know, if for some hypothetical case, somebody got physical access to one machine, the probability that A, there's an entire file on that machine is low, and B, all of the chunks are encrypted with different keys. So the attack surface, again, defense in depth, is lowered with every step. All right, so when we talk about encryption, uh, sorry, endpoint security, Google on our end, we use you know, devices that are updated centrally. They auto-update. They make sure that there are strong security primitives on the device. And we also make these devices and softwares available to our customers, which we'll talk a little bit about later. And uh, you know, when we talk about defense in depth, one of the easiest things an organization can do to secure their technology, to secure their systems, is have two-factor or multi-factor authentication in place. Right? This helps you know, prevent against phishing. This helps uh, add an additional layer of auditing and logging, and, and basically make it so that the attack surface is, again, reduced. All right. So uh, now that we've talked a little bit of an overview into how Google secures our production systems and makes services available to customers, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how customers should think about their controls that are available to them. Right? Not everything is going to be handled by the cloud provider because Google wants to give customers the flexibility to build the systems that it needs to build. We don't know what data you want, you know, data schema you want. We don't know where you want it stored. We don't know what network setup you want. But what we do want to do is give you the controls to do what it is you need to do. All right, so I have a similar diagram. Our philosophy of defense in depth you know, transcends our own sphere of influence, and we would like to give customers that same ability. Right? So customers are working on potentially the same level of controls that we are. Customers care about infrastructure security uh, in some cases. Uh, but in, in our case, we've taken care of that one, right? So customers care about network security, care about data security, application security, identity and access management, endpoints, uh, monitoring and operations, and then, of course, wrapping it nice and tight together in that governance, risk, and compliance framework, right? So the way I think about this left column uh, of governance, risk, and compliance is basically good documentation and policies around everything else on the slide. So if you don't have good data security, for example, your compliance is going to be hard for you. All right, so this, this is kind of the, the framework of protections uh, that are in place. Diving into a little bit more detail, uh, but, but first, you know, touching again on shared security, because I really think that's a fundamental consideration for this, is when we think about our infrastructure services, right? Google has taken care of the hardware, how the underlying hardware boots, what kernel it has, how the data is encrypted and stored, how the audit logging is done. But then when we make that guest OS, right, that is kind of the layer at which the controls become available to the customer. Do they want Linux? Do they want Windows? Do they want something else, right, something proprietary? And that's the level of control to which customers uh, start at on our infrastructure services. If you don't want that level of control, if you don't need that level of flexibility for every system, why not take advantage of one of the platform as a service solutions, right? And that's because Google has, again, made more sane choices about the security of those systems, all the way at up to, potentially, the application itself. Uh, in which case, you can drop in your business logic and you know, rest assured that the underlying features have been accounted for, and you have less and less responsibility over time. Uh, and this translates also into our uh, software as a service solution, so G Suite, uh, which encompasses Gmail Drive. Right? Basically, the only thing you're doing in that case is uh, managing the data, managing who can access the data, and managing uh, who you share the data with. All right. So going into those same categories, right? where, where do customer responsibilities lie in identity and access? First, we should talk about what that means on Google Cloud, right? I think we can get a little bit into some of the technical details here. We can say that on Google Cloud, there are two types of uh, 
uh, or two main types of identities, right? We can have a human identity, which is me doing work as myself, uh, and we can also have service accounts or what we call robot identities. Uh, that's like some service doing work on behalf of a system, on behalf of a group of people, uh, serving an API, doing cron jobs on data, basically things that a human uh, wanted to automate, so they let a machine do it periodically or a machine do it for the scope of security. The way these accounts authenticate is different, right? So when you have a human account, you log on to GCP, you'll type in your username and password, you'll enter, hopefully, as you should, your second factor or third factor of authentication, and then you will function as yourself. When you want to authenticate to, you know, when a service account wants to authenticate, it's provided a key. And that key basically says, this is the, you know, this service account is accredited for this organization for this scope of uh, performing, uh, performing this scope of operations. And uh, you know, it's important to note that at some point, things become similar, right? Both humans and service accounts need IAM roles, IAM permissions on resources in order to modify them, in order to use them, uh, things like that. So uh, key, key concept here, right? Different types of identity, different types of accounts are relevant to different applications. If you're doing an admin operation, you might want to use a human account because it's an ad hoc, one-off, thing, right? If you're automating something, if you're providing a service, scoping down the exact service operations to a robot account helps maintain security. And it helps maintain security because that robot is scoped to only a limited set of duties. And it can't override that scope. All right. Taking this one step further, right? Now, now we talked about manipulating resources on Google Cloud. What about securing applications? So Google takes you know, the identity model one step further and has made something available to customers called Identity Aware Proxy. And, and what this is is a load balancer and proxy that sits in front of uh, applications. And when a user request comes in, uh, the IAP basically does a check for who that user is, what they're entitled to do on the application, and those things have to match. So not only does it do uh, you know, identity-based controls, it also does context controls. Is, is this user accessing the service from an approved IP address? Are they accessing the service from an approved uh, you know, partner service? So a lot of these checks can be done at this proxy layer and make sure that only legitimate requests, legitimate access can make it into the backend application. All right, so now talking about you know, user controls for encryption, data management, and transmission protection. First, remember when I showed you the diagram about how Google encrypts data by default? Well, it, it turns out that's only one of the encryption options available on Google Cloud, and it's the, the leftmost one here, what we call default encryption. So you know, it's the same diagram we have uh, on the previous slide, just show, showcasing the other two options for key management. So maybe, you know, you want a little bit more control than the default encryption. You want to specify which keys are used to encrypt which files, how often those keys are rotated, when those keys are deleted, and whether you know, any of the keys need to be reused over time. Basically, the default uh, encryption has made all of those decisions for you and, and offered it in a managed service approach. But if any one of those decisions sounds like a decision you need to make, that's what customer managed encryption keys are for. Uh, and what you do is you'd configure the service, say, I would like to manage the encryption keys. When that service needs to encrypt a file, it will go to find the key you specify, encrypt it or decrypt it, and then put that key back. There is an even more controlled option called customer supplied keys. And what this enables you to do is not store any of the encryption keys on Google Cloud. So both of the first option, which is default encryption, and the second option, customer managed encryption keys, store the encryption keys in what we call Google Cloud KMS, our key management system. If you want to store the encryption keys on-prem, then you can use customer supplied encryption keys. And the way you would do that is in the API request to access a file, you specify the encryption key, and that file is decrypted and sent to you, and the key is not stored. And the same thing works when you're storing a file. So you give it the file, you give it the encryption key you want. We perform our chunking and encryption the same way we normally would, but we use your key and we destroy it afterwards so that you have to keep supplying it. The one thing I will caveat with this is that this can be difficult to get right. 
Um, you know, it is possible if you don't have a robust existing key management service on-prem or on another cloud system, wherever you're storing your keys, you can encrypt data. We don't store the key, and if you don't store that key, that data is effectively gone. Right, so it's like important to say that while this offers more control, it also offers more responsibility. All right, so another thing that you know you can use to control the access uh, and permissions around data on cloud is VPC service controls. And what this allows you to do is define a security perimeter around Google Cloud Platform resources to constrain data to that perimeter, uh, basically you know, control when data leaves uh, or comes into that security perimeter, and help mitigate data leaving that perimeter. So uh, VPC has kind of three main use cases, right? We talked about, we'll talk about mitigating data exfiltration. So what this diagram is showing here is by setting up the virtual perimeter, you can prevent the number of exfiltration pathways to only what you want, right? So let's say that you have a GCS bucket and you only want it to be accessed within services in a specific network, but not by any services outside of that network. So what you would do is you would put, you know, configure the VPC, uh, uh, sorry, service controls so that the services that should access the data are on the same network, and services that shouldn't access the data are outside that. And then configure it such that it basically auto-rejects anything coming in that, shouldn't, uh, that isn't already on that network. All right. This is also a great enabler for hybrid cloud, uh, you know, hybrid GCP, hybrid with other clouds, hybrid cloud and on-prem, et cetera. So you can include on-prem resources in your VPC network. And what that will allow you to do is securely access resources on Google Cloud from your on-premise environment and vice versa. So this is a really good uh, you know, security control for, making it, for extending your on-premise network to cover Google Cloud, uh, again, and vice versa. All right, and, and lastly, combined with identity-aware proxy, uh, VPC is also an important service for enforcing context-aware access, right? So in, in this case, it's not only the identity of the accessing service or the individual that matters, it's also the context for which they're uh, applying for access. So you can say it's like, where's this user located? Maybe you have you know, data for some of your users that needs to stay within uh, a certain network boundary, right? You don't want it to leave their organization's network. But you know that it may potentially need to be accessed from one of your partner organizations, and that access is allowed. So in, in this case, you can set up your default network to be restricted to one organization, block IP addresses outside that. But you can also allow you know, accesses from IP addresses belonging to your partner organization, which both allows you the you know, flexibility to work with your partners, as well as having the security of having data uh, in the system. All right, so talking about audit and activity logging. One of the ways Google has kind of helped aggregate all of the audit and activity logs is through Cloud Security Command Center. Was what Cloud Security Command Center does is it you know, scans through your Google Cloud platform resources, uh, detects and responds to threats in the system, and also you know, aggregates those for you. So when you think about you know, uh, issues like misconfigured access policies, misconfigured net network policies, uh, public storage buckets, you know, issues that are basically fundamental security checks that you want to be conducting all of the time, Cloud Security Command Center is the service that would be conducting those checks and then surfacing that data to your, uh, you know, to your admins, to the project owners, to make sure that uh, the events are caught as early as possible. Uh, yes. Cool. One of the, the cool things about you know, Cloud Security Command Center is it was built for uh, a, a hybrid environment, right? So we, we know that people here don't necessarily just have Google Cloud Platform resources. People have made investments into on-prem technologies, people are using multi-cloud, and those don't disappear the moment you start using GCP, right? So we know that we've built a number of detectors that function well with our uh, native Cloud Platform tools, but we also integrate with a number of partners who you may already be using, who you may consider using, and we also have capabilities to put your own monitoring data in Cloud Security Command Center and make it that holistic audit and logging tool for getting security and monitoring insights into the organization. All right, 
So you know, getting, getting towards the end of the audit and activity logging session, I think most people here know about cloud audit logging. They know about access transparency. Uh, to summarize, cloud audit logging logs your organization's activities on your data, and access transparency logging logs the cloud uh, provider's actions on your data. So this could be something like an approved support activity, you know, a, a bug ticket you file for a service. If somebody at Google needs to go in and help you resolve that ticket, you'll get an access transparency log that says, this ticket was resolved. We had to access this project for this reason. And you can basically track everything in one place. All right. So uh, how we tie this all together, right? So we know that Google has some responsibilities. Customers have some responsibilities. Uh, it's important to showcase how all of this works. Uh, and I'll do this in two parts. So I'll, I'll show you the Cloud Healthcare API, which is kind of a managed service for uh, data aggregation, data storage, data processing on Google Cloud for healthcare data. And I'll also show you how that service can fit into a larger organization architecture with an alignment on HIPAA compliance. Okay, so overview into the Cloud Healthcare API. Uh, the cloud, like I said, the Cloud Healthcare API implements industry standard protocols and formats. In this case, you know, DICOM data for radiology records for uh, medical imaging data, FHIR, which is for electronic health records, uh, text, let's say, and uh, HL7, which is for clinical messaging, right? And what we use the cloud, or what we hope the cloud healthcare API will help enable is accelerated ingestion, storage, analysis, and integration of healthcare data with cloud-based applications. What do I mean by that? So the healthcare API provides a secure gateway from an off-cloud system into advanced capabilities on Google Cloud, like BigQuery for analysis, TensorFlow for ML, ML Engine for more ML, because you can never have too much ML. Uh, and, and together, you know, we hope that this, this tooling and this product helps you aggregate your data in cloud and make it available across modalities, across formats, for holistic views of uh, patients for, you know, to enable better research and care. OK, how does the a healthcare API look, right? So the healthcare API is just very similar to other cloud storage services. It is an API that sits in a region. So think of you know, London uh, or LA or something like that. And within that healthcare API region, you have a data set. And that data set consists of multiple stores or buckets of different types of healthcare data. So the interesting things to note here is a lot of the HIPAA compliance responsibilities have been taken care of for you, right? So the storage layer is done. Uh, a lot of the networking layer is done. Uh, and uh, the encryption layer comes with the storage layer is also done. And uh, the other thing to notice here is that data is aggregated ac across different modalities in a single data set, right? So we have text data that's structured. We have image data that's structured, uh, pixel data and uh, text. And we have uh, clinical messages. And all of those in one data set helps enable different uh, applications, right? So let's imagine that you're trying to retrieve medical imaging data for care or for creating AI or ML models. What you might want to do here is use the healthcare API as that connection piece between an on-premise uh, PAX or, or a DICOM router. A DICOM router is basically just a fancy uh, name for something that speaks, reads, writes, medical imaging format DICOM and connects different systems together. And, and then on the other side of that healthcare API, you have you know, your analytics and ML modules, your application ecosystem. Potentially, this is where you, know, you let partners access data, you let patients access data, um, and you know, anything in between. When we talk about uh, HL7, important in the clinical space, um, not necessarily much outside that, but basically, you know, it's the way that different devices and uh, operations within a hospital c communicate with each other. So if I'm a patient hooked up to a glucose monitor, a blood pressure cuff, HL7 would be the format by which updates for my condition get sent to the, my canonical patient record. Uh, and what we've done is we've turned this kind of weird proprietary HL7 format into structured JSON, right? And what that does is helps make it available for analytics, research, you name it. All right. So where is this all going, right? Why, why is this important to uh, the HIPAA security presentation? Is that what, what we're doing with the healthcare API is translating data in multiple formats to a canonical standard format and then making that data available to the rest of Google Cloud 
all of the rest of the Google Cloud HIPAA compliant or HIPAA aligned services. And uh, what this enables is it enables you to reduce the burden of setting this up yourself. It enables you to reduce the burden of setting up the security and compliance for you know, this translation layer, for the storage layer yourself, and then lets you concentrate on doing what I would call core business activities, right? I, I think in a lot of cases, security is table stakes for an organization. Security is something you have to get right. But security is not the end goal, right? Like, why are we securing data is so we can do something with it. And, and that something can be research, that something can be patient care, that something can be you know, improving the quality of treatments. Uh, but securing the data for the sake of security is generally not the end goal. And what we're doing here is, is wrapping that security layer into a, uh, I guess, product layer that can do other things. All right. I think talking about, you know, what, what some people consider the holy grail of research is being able to see longitudinal patient data from multiple sources in multiple formats in one place. Uh, I'm not saying we've solved it. I, I'm just saying there's a possibility that it can be done, right? So it's like you have data from multiple formats, you want to get it into the healthcare API, and then you want to turn it into BigQuery, which is where you'll get your you know, SQL-friendly uh, query language uh, across all of these domains, which used to have different formats. All right. From a security purpose, maybe you want to de-identify your data before you share it with other people. The healthcare API supports you know, native de-identification of data in these FHIR formats. So what we've done is we've taken the structure of FHIR, uh, parsed it, and said, you know, we know this field contains patient names. So if you want to take out patient names, we can do that. We know some fields contain dates. If those dates need to be removed to protect patient privacy or shifted to maintain patient privacy, we can do that. Uh, what's not shown here is free text, right? So free text is another, there are long strings of provider notes. Uh, we can do that as well. It just isn't on this slide. Talking about doing that in DICOM, DICOM files contain patient data in metadata, or sorry, patient information and in metadata, which you see in the top left and right, and patient data burnt into the pixel data, right, in the, in the middle bottom. Uh, our de-identification tools can also strip that up. And thinking about HIPAA compliance, this is a, a fundamental ability in, you know, data processing and, and data protection, right? So when you're sending data between organizations, one of the things that's important to HIPAA is data is protected in transit. And one of the ways you can protect patient data in transit is to not send any patient data in the first place. Uh, so de-identifying the files before they're sent, you know, between organizations, before they're published, is a, is a great way to kind of uh, meet the HIPAA requirements while still meeting the business requirements. All right. Uh, finally, Tying it all together, right? How can something like this look? So the sample that I have here is uh, the user journey is you have some data that exists off of Google Cloud. Uh, perhaps this is on-prem in a colo in your own data center, uh, on a third-party infrastructure, on another cloud, on a managed service uh, provider. There's quite a number of options here, right? And you want to move that data to cloud, get a canonical data storage platform. Then make that data available to research partners, to your own organization, to third-party services, uh, and anything in between. But at the same time, maintain HIPAA, right? That's kind of the, the key methodology here, or maintain GDPR, right? Like the, the controls can change, uh, but the intent stays the same. So uh, the way I've broken this up here is into four uh, what we call GCP projects, right? And that's the data ingestion project, the data storage and analysis project, the data sharing project, and the monitoring and auditing project. Uh, I've included some underlying management services here, like our logging platform, our IAM platform, uh, what we call our, our stack driver services for debugging and, and monitoring. Uh, not because they're in a separate project, but just because they underlie you know, all of the other ones, and I didn't want to duplicate them uh, in all of the above. So uh, again, so now we've, we've talked about the use case, right? Why is, why is this use case relevant? Uh, this is what we think as one of the fundamental user journeys for a cloud, you know, cloud migration, right? You'll want to take data from multiple disparate sources, ingest it, normalize it, aggregate it, and then make it available uh, for use. Cool. All right, so breaking this down, 
uh, into individual steps, right? And how, how does HIPAA kind of interplay in all of these things? So this is our first project, data ingestion. So the, the data ingestion layer is you know, where you'll move raw patient data onto Google Cloud, uh, perform an ETL uh, operation, extract, transform, and load, uh, and basically change that data from one format in its native on-premise format to a cloud native format. And here, the protections that would be in place are is its temporary storage, its ephemeral machines that are doing transformation. And it's on a separate network because we don't want you know, that network to be, the, the network that goes from on-premise to cloud, we don't want to contaminate it by giving it access too far. All right. Now that we've ingested and normalized the data, we probably want to move it to a canonical data store, right? And here is what some people would call a data lake, uh, a data aggregation layer. It, it does storage. It does analysis. It might be where you serve some of the, the ML applications. It writes logs to the audit project. And most importantly, no external network connectivity, right? So this, this means that your network for this application is locked down to only your organization. It means that the core uh, data layer is only accessible by services uh, and service accounts that are providing, you know, those service accounts may be providing public services, but no public access to this project directly for obvious reasons. Uh, but you know, there does come a time when you do want to provide services externally. Uh, this, you know, in some cases can be done in a different project. This may be done in a different uh, VPC. Here we've shown it as, you know, both, right? It's in a different project with its own network. This project can connect through service accounts uh, to the data aggregation layer, and it can also connect to external uh, services, right? So this being, maybe you want to serve an ML model publicly. So you, this service would expose a public endpoint. Somebody can make an API request to it. It would then send a service account back to this project. Uh, that service account request would go grab something from the underlying data set. It would bring it back to this project, aggregate it, and share it publicly. So what, what we've you know, left out so far is the big component of HIPAA is centralized logging and, and monitoring, right? If, if any patient data is touched, there should be a log entry. If that log entry is uh, flagged, there needs to be manual auditing of the activity to make sure that it was legitimate or illegitimate and then appropriate actions taken afterwards, right? So what this project is doing is kind of simplifying all that monitoring uh, for you. Uh, I won't say for you, but simplifying all that monitoring in one place. So all of the other projects are sending audit logs here. All of the other projects are sending system logs here, monitoring data. And then in this project, you would put you know, your, your rules, your triggers, your alerts, your notifications, such that not only is it seeing activity from individual projects, it's also seeing activity holistically, right? So it can, it can account for trends across different uh, things in the environment. And the, the benefit of aggregating all these logs together is uh, specifically that, right? Is like now you get access to full tr uh, trends, to patterns, to longitudinal accesses and, and how data moves throughout the system. Whereas if you were just looking at logs from a single project, you wouldn't get that. Okay. This is probably some, uh, I guess, of my opinions on best practices for audit logging. It's, you know, it's what we recommend for internal teams. It's what we recommend to uh, some of our customers and partners as well. It's, you know, turn on data access logging. So cloud, we know, has two forms of audit logging, admin activity, which is on by default, and data access logging, which captures access to data. So turn on data access logging for services that are holding PHI, right? Uh, set up audit log export. We talked about that and why it's important. And uh, configure access control for logs appropriately, right? Like there's, you, you want to avoid the situation where somebody who did malicious things to your data can then go delete the audit logs for that. Uh, and lastly, you actually want to look at the audit logs. Also obvious. <laughs> okay. This, it, this process, right, of making a HIPAA-aligned project architecture is something that is not impossible, but it is common, right? And, and when our team looked at all of these activities and said, you know, what are the things that go into making a HIPAA-aligned project? 
it was basically things like controlling access, controlling encryption, controlling network boundaries, controlling audit logs. Uh, so what we did was we created a set of open source tooling. We're unofficially calling it the Data Protection Toolkit. And it allows for infrastructure as code deployment of projects that are designed to meet some sort of organizational regulatory compliance requirements, right? So it leverages uh, Deployment Manager, which is a HIPAA aligned service, uh, and you know, soon to be Terraform, which is a popular open source toolkit as well. What, what this actually does is it aggregates you know, an entire scope of HIPAA activities into one toolkit. So what you'll do is you'll define you know, what resources you want. You want some compute, some storage, some networking, and you'll define the controls that you want in place. You know, some resources shouldn't be public. Some resources should prevent uh, data access. S some resources should generate more logs than others. And some resources should be allowed to be shared, right? So it, it, you're basically, there's a controls library and a resources library. And you will choose the specific scope of resources you're interested in and the specific scope of policies you're interested in. And this service will automatically deploy them and create a GCP project. At the same time as doing so, it will also put a continuous monitoring framework around those resources. And what that continuous monitoring framework will do is periodically interrogate the resources you set up against the policies that you set up and give you data. Uh, that data can be, you know, yes, everything's good, or that data can be, here's a violation, you should probably look into it. Uh, and what that enables is you know, to meet the HIPAA requirements of audit and monitoring. Uh, kind of all from one continuous tool chain. Why, why did we choose you know, Forseti for the monitoring engine? So for those of you who ha aren't familiar with Forseti security, it's a native uh, open source tooling for Google Cloud that builds an inventory of projects, scans it uh, repeatedly and periodically for a set of policies, and in a certain case of policies, uh, you know, actually enforces against malicious changes. So if you set an inventory, uh, you know, in, when we think back to here, if you said in the deployment stage, you want three VMs and two storage buckets, this inventory is gonna get created and hopefully it should contain three VMs and two storage buckets. And if it doesn't contain three VMs and two storage buckets, that scanner is gonna pick it up and send you an alert so you can go back and, and correct it, right? And, and, and all of this over time uh, is kind of saying, you know, if you defined your HIPAA policies a certain way, as your organization grows, uh, you may need more resources, but new resources that you create will be uh, under the same policy framework that you set up originally. All right. So, you know, why we think this, this tooling is helpful to customers, right? It's, it's a secure, what we call quick start. As I was saying, security is not, is, is fundamentally important, but it's not necessarily the end goal, right? So this is a framework to help, you know, people get up and running quickly on GCP by creating predictable, consistent, secure workloads that then let you do your business requirements. So this is saying, you know, if you have to create identical development, testing, and production environments to run a medical device, because that's the regulatory framework, you know, this tool will allow you to write one template, run it three times. Uh, the other thing it'll allow you to do is if, you know, you have a canonical data layer and you want to give uh, researchers or partners access to that data and you want to give it to them in a lockdown environment, these templates will let you spin up lockdown identical environments for each research group that's accessing the data. Uh, and the other thing is because this is an infrastructure as code framework, uh, it's easy to share these templates across teams and across institutions. All right. So now, you know, talking about some customers who are successfully running HIPAA-aligned workloads on Google Cloud, uh, you know, three examples generally come to mind that showcase the range of activities. Uh, so we have, you know, the University of Colorado Health Data Compass has used Google Cloud to achieve HIPAA compliance on a data warehouse. And this has helped them, you know, reduce query times from many hours to just a few minutes and has helped them you know, cut operating costs and make their research programs more scalable. Uh, and this is, again, you know, following the model of shared responsibility. So previously, they were managing all of this on-prem. By moving uh, their infrastructure to Google Cloud, they cut their compliance responsibility by a significant portion and realized other benefits at the same time, leading to you know, faster research. Uh, yeah. So, 
you know, second example, you'll, you'll start to see a trend develop, right? Move workloads to cloud helps reduce responsibility, helps reallocate more bandwidth, money, energy, time to other activities, leading to the acceleration of the core business requirements. So specifically for the NIH, National Institutes on Aging, you know, they were able to process uh, 200 terabytes of data in just a few weeks, which would normally have taken them months, right? And this is, a, this is an institution that had hardware that was potentially older. They used the same amount of funds on cloud-based hardware and processed that data much faster. And lastly, you know, the Broad Institute is doing uh, genomic analysis on Google Cloud. And uh, moving their infrastructure here has helped them you know, accelerate the analysis of human genomes by 400%. They have instituted new and different security protections than they were able to do on-prem. And again, the trend continues, right? Allocated resources better led to more efficient research patterns. And with that, thank you for joining uh, us today. And I'll be around to take any questions. <laughs>